Good evening, everybody. My name is Matt Abbott, and welcome to the latest Insta session. Uh, I formed the Nymphs and Fugs label five years ago last month, um, and obviously we were supposed to be finishing our big Livewire tour recently with a final show in Leeds and then a show in Colchester as well. We couldn't do that, so I decided to do these weekly Insta sessions instead where I, I invite some of my favourite poets from all over the UK for really relaxed conversation and performance. And I'm hoping to invite people from further afield at some point as well. Um, but for now, it's just my favourite poets from around the UK that I might not be able to afford to pay to travel around all the time. Um, but fortunately, through the luxury of the internet, we can basically do it in our front rooms. So today, we've got uh, Stephen Lightbound. Uh, Stephen is a Bristol-paced poet who writes mainly about his experience as a wheelchair user. Uh, his debut collection, Only Air, was published by Burning Eye last year. I first saw Stephen perform at Shambhala Festival last summer and he was absolutely class. Um, I love his poetry, I love everything about his way, I love uh, his activism. So really excited to welcome him today. Uh, we're going to have a chat until about 8 o'clock and then Stephen will go and I'll tell you who we've got for next week. So, shall I invite him to join the call? This is when I get nervous because I'm not very good at tech. There, I've pressed the wrong button already. Here we go. See if it works. Mm -mm. Hi, spot on. Hi, How are you doing, mate? Yeah, good, thank you. Ah, oh, buzzing. Thanks for agreeing to do this, mate. I really appreciate it. Um, they've just been really chilled so far, and like, like I was saying just then, it means I can contact people from all over the shop. Um, so yeah, I'm buzzing. Now, have you have you had a good day? Yeah, not bad. Yeah, it's um, uh, I've got a. a Weirdly, for, for lockdown, I'm, I'm back in work, so I've had a week off this week, which isn't that different to time in lockdown pre-work. We're still sat at home, trying to do a bit of writing, trying to watch a bit of telly, trying to go out where you can do. So, yeah, it's been it's been all right. It's been all right. So, you're not, were you furloughed at any point? or I'm not, no. Of... So, I, I, I work for the NHS as my day job. So, um, yeah. yeah, so still going in. I mean, not in a particularly important role. I work in, in communications, so I deal with all the kind of media requests and stuff like that for hospitals. So, yeah. Right. Really important stuff to the people that know what they're doing. <laughs> really busy time for you at the moment, then. It must be crazy. Yeah, I mean, we've been sort of fairly lucky because we're down in the southwest. So, um, you know, it's, it's been busy, it's been intense, but not chaotic, I think is the way that I look at it because I think we've kind of been slightly separated from the real intense parts of the, the country down in the southwest. Um, you know, so yeah. we've had we've had little peaks, but not nothing nothing really major. Um, right. you know, we've seen seen bits here and there that are on the increase, but but yeah, we've been all right so far. Cool. Oh well that's good to know. And how how has it affected you as an artist? Have you struggled to motivate yourself to write new stuff or Yeah, I think well, right at the start of all of this, um, I think my wife and I came down with covid fairly early on i think um really? and um yeah we, we before we could get it sort of tested or anything like that so but we kind of did all the symptom checkers and and everything like that and we were pretty clear i think my my wife having lost her taste and smell was the big indicator for us and um and i was pretty i felt really wiped out for maybe like three weeks so i wasn't doing much at all then and then after that i was kind of eking back into it really i was lucky i had a, a couple of projects on the go that we're yeah. probably maybe like 80, 90 percent there. Um, right. I'm like I'm writing like a little kids book at the moment, um, like a, a novel aimed at like eight to twelve year olds. And I, and I got I I was probably in a version where I, I could keep tinkering away at that and kind of editing it and just going into it and dipping into it. I'd slowly right. I think a bit like trying to go back to the gym when you've not been for six months. I have kind of flexed yeah. those flexed those muscles again and kind of got going and and and, and done like. The odd rep here and there and then you know a line of a poem here and then a line of a poem there and then i've kind of got back to feeling like i'm sort of been writing some poems sort of fairly steadily really i think so just trying to get stuff down every day i think i mean but yeah. equally i think it's important there's no pressure to to get something down as well because i know everyone's in completely different places um it's weird, and, it? yeah yeah it's, it's just trying to get you can down. down sorry <laughs> um it's good that you've managed to take the pressure off because I know a lot of people are finding that pressure to be productive and like, you know, everyone's saying, oh, you can write a novel now or you can write a collection now and they'll look back and think, I've not made the most of lockdown. But it's mad, isn't it? Like creatively, you do have a bit of a cloud over your head, don't you? Like it's a bit hard to sort of get that clarity as a poet. That, that's right, yeah. I think I'd been, the two projects I was working on 
so weird in the sense that the, the, the book that I was just talking about is about, um, I don't see much um, representation in kind of like the arts of, of people with disabilities, particularly some people with spinal cord injuries like myself, so wheelchair users, and particularly yeah. in like children's literature. Um, and so I kind of, I've been, one, the book I've been writing is about that, but it's about a kid that won't leave the house. He's too, you know, something happens outside and he's not able to leave the house. So I'm kind of reading this now thing, and it was supposed to be set in the future, and it's so out of date already. It was honestly, it was meant to be set 20 years ahead, and it's completely right. out of date. All of the stuff that's happened already. And then I was writing some a series of poems about someone again who's a wheelchair user and wakes up one day and feel and re realizes the only person left alive, and he he what it means to be kind of. And I was writing about things like being isolated, but unsocially, like how are you isolated out in the in the world if you leave your house and there's no one there and what that would mean and again i'm writing about stuff then i was like yeah this is all out of date now so it's i've been kind of looking at that and not trying to give up hope and just kind of crack on with it still and and uh see if there's still a still a home for these poems at some point fair enough that sounds amazing that it's nice that you had the project on the go like you say but yeah i guess the world's changed so much in the last few weeks trying to set for something in the future that's nuts um, I'll look forward to seeing how it comes, how it comes along. Um, so do you fancy giving us a poem? I will, yeah. And I think um, yeah. this is one you've seen, seen before. Um, I've dropped my book. But this is, yeah, this is one you've seen before. So I thought it kind of made sense to start with this one because I know we've got a, a mutual connection, which is a, a ball that gets kicked around on a, a grass now and again. So, um, yeah, this is the, uh, and this is where the prop comes in behind me. So Cool. Yeah, uh, this is called Should Have Kept Quiet. We sit in a Shoreditch cafe, breakfast ordered, halloumi on a round of hipster beards. You ask me if I've ever felt like this before, and I say, yeah, with Alan Shearer. Before shared Chris with Lineker, before he was a magpie who shunned silver for adulation, he was my god in blue and white halves and a rose on his chest. He was Blackburn Rovers number nine. He would rampage on the turf, ball as an extra limb, eyes forward, power as beauty. He'd smash balls past ghost-gloved hands, wheel away to the corner flag, one arm raised in celebration. It was classic Alan. I would stand with my 30,000 strong congregation, or rise and fall, an ecstatic breath from which we exhaled as one. Shearer, Shearer, Shearer. I had Alan's name tattooed on the back of my shirt. Posters of Alan covered my walls like gift wrap. Alan argues with the referee. Alan wins a header. Alan scores. Alan in the home kit. Alan in the away kit. Alan in a 1990s shell suit, not allowed near a naked flame. Alan <laughs> everywhere. It was wall to wall Alan. And in 1995, Alan led us to the Premier League title. Blackburn Rovers. We were the English champions. It genuinely was the greatest time of my life. That was until the 27th of January, 1996, when it snowed. Great white tipex, start of fresh snow. No football anywhere. So I went sledging instead. I hit a tree. I brought my back. Wheelchair user. It was as simple as that. There was no more feet on terraces. And I needed more than posters. I needed Alan. I'm in intensive care. I'm in formation with seven other broken teammates thrown together yesterday. Eyes fixed on the door. Thoughts of my own full time for company. In walks Tim Flowers. He was Blackman's goalkeeper. He was England's number one. And he was followed by Mike Newell, one of Alan's fellow forwards. And then, no, it, no, it's Alan, Alan flipping Shearer. The heart monitor I was hooked up to explodes into life, fueled by embers of mine. Alan is bundled to one side as nurses rush to halt my cardiac arrest that wasn't. After all these years, I had told Alan through the medium of a heart monitor just how much I loved him. And in return, he gave me a signed copy of this book, Alan Shearer's Diary of the Season. I'm going to read a quick extract. It seems, it seems relevant. 
<laughs> April 1995, Sunday the 2nd. I celebrate our six point lead at the top of the table in style by creosoting the new fence and enjoying a day in front of the box. I just say actually, Matt, as an interjection, if people think that they can't get creative and they've no work, they've nothing left to do, aim that high. That's what I would say. <laughs> <laughs> I realize the halloumi has squeak has fallen silent and I'm back in Shoreditch. I look at you, my new strike partner, and your dating profile flashes before my eyes. I like fitness, but hate sport, especially football. I take my cue from the cheese, swallow words with a gulp of tea. In hindsight, I should have just said, no dear, I've never felt like this before. <laughs> nice one, beautiful. And uh, yeah. that I give you a little get... thing there. So that is, that's actually uh, Alan, Tim Flowers and Mike Newell, and that's, that's me in hospital. So that's actually oh. the, the, the thing that that poem's about, yeah. Amazing. And obviously when you did it at Shambhala, you managed to get an entire tent of people chanting, Shira, Shira. <laughs> it's, 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 a, it's a poetry high, that is. I don't think I'll ever, I don't know if I'll ever beat that. I mean, that was incredible. Yeah, it was. It was such a great moment. It was beautiful. Um, cool. Yeah, I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed that. Do you fancy giving us another one of them? We'll have a little chat. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm going to read a poem. I think... Um, can I give a bit of an intro to this? Is that, is that all right? Yeah. Do whatever you want, yeah. Yeah. So I think one of the things that I've really um, been interested in with lockdown is that in many ways, things like these, these intercessions and, and Zoom and all the online stuff, has meant I've felt a lot more connected to the world than I've ever done before. Like I've, yeah. I'm not having to check access to venues. I'm not having to check whether or not something's got a disabled loop and whether or not there's a stage and I can perform and all that sort of stuff. So it's been really great. Apart from the fact I feel like I've kind of lost a bit of my identity because the bit that everyone sees that makes me sort of ironically stand out is the chair. So actually that doesn't exist on these, on these little clips. So I think that's been interesting. And I kind yeah. of have a real hope that this stuff stays and, and is around um, when lockdown ends, that we can keep some stuff online because it's yeah. enabled, um, not everybody, but it has enabled a lot of people to feel more connected. And it reminds me, actually, I think I, um, the last time I felt like this was during the 2012 Olympics in London, and actually more specifically the Paralympics. And um, for the Paralympics, London became so accessible overnight. I was living in London at the time. And uh, my local pub, I lived near the O2 Arena, and my local pub changed its name to the Wheelchair Basketballer. And it put pictures of people playing wheelchair basketball on all the walls. And it put a ramp into the front door. And after the Paralympics finished, it all came down and the ramp came out. And loads of other things like that in terms of access came down. And so as far as I was concerned, there was no Paralympic legacy. It, like, it, it, it didn't make it beyond the weekend. So um, in, in my book, there's a poem about that. So I'm going to read this because it sort of feels relevant, even though eight years on, we're still kind of banging on about the same things. Cool. So this is called A Paralympic Dream Stuck in 2012. A golden mustard globule falls like a medal from the sky. It lands unseen in a family-sized diet court for one. He shoots, he scores. I watch intently as a hot dog hand is clapped against a Team GB form finger. A capacity crowd, wheelchair basketball at the O2. This is the unthinkable happening. I count how long the adulation will last. 2,400 seconds, four 10 minute quarters of fitting in. My height, now useless at slam dunks, but once good at the game we watch, grasps at the hysteria in hungry swipes. I turn to my wife, where are all these people yesterday? She replies, just enjoy the fact they're here. Tomorrow, this city will return to the home of good intentions, empty promises and inaccessible tube stations. Cheers for chairs will be as distant as the shrill full-time whistle soon to be blown. In the morning, I will play a new game, Reflection Roulette. Which version of me will London see tomorrow? Will this Paralympic legacy even make it to Monday? After the match, I tweet the star player for Team GB. Hey Dan, I don't know if you remember me. We played together 10 years ago. Watched you at the O2 tonight. Thought you were brill. A tiny bird brings a message. Hey man. Of course I remember you. How are things? I'm not sure, I think. Great, I reply. 
Beautiful, that. Nice. I can't believe how quickly it was all they got rid of it. That's that's really harsh, man. I, I obviously I'm. It's not something I'd notice, obviously. I, but that's that's really uh, eye opening. Like, um, yeah. So mm-hmm. I, when you lived in, did you find that London was better than other cities, or did, I'm sure I read in an interview that you said that Bristol was actually much better, and without Bristol, you wouldn't have been able to write your debut collection. Is that right, or for poetry? Yeah. So I think. Um, London, I think, is a, is a city that is a city full of opportunities, but also a city of frustrations. I found yeah. that um, in all the time I lived in London, I never say I went to Notting Hill just because there was no way of getting there. Like, you know, I'd have had to get right. like three buses or whatever it was. So I tended to kind of congregate around the Jubilee line. So I chose somewhere to live on the Jubilee line because pretty much most of that is accessible because it was one of the newer yeah. lines. And then as newer lines and newer stations became more accessible, London opened up to me Um, and like but then also a lot of the venues you'd want to go to something and and you'd find that it wasn't accessible and actually when I moved to Bristol we kind of moved to Bristol on this promise that you know this is a massive creative city there's more music and art venues and things like that than you ever could imagine and that is true but so many of them are not accessible and I think that was a a massive eye on it for me and a huge disappointment when we got here that actually a lot of the stuff was was out of bounds to us um, right. but one of the things that I was really lucky about was that a lot of the poetry venues were accessible and a lot of the poetry nights were and so immediately okay. there was this kind of crowd that kind of welcomed you in and um, one of the good things about Bristol and the poetry community in Bristol is that that it's so it's so warm in its prayers you know I think somebody is just as happy to give feedback on a poem and put someone else in front of a microphone and they ought to read one of their own poems and yeah. it's it's a very kind of collective environment in that sense where I think you know the nights are really welcome you start to see the similar people um which has its pros and cons because I think you know um you start to then you kind of start to mimic the people that you're hearing if you hear them often enough so I think you know that yeah. repetition is a good thing but also I think sometimes you, it's good to hear new voices and get out and kind of you know um hear what's going on in other cities so yeah I think for me my, my poetry really flourished when I moved to Bristol because there was such a, a great environment for me to, to kind of write and perform in. yeah and Bernie and I books being based there I guess is nice because you've got a, a slightly closer relationship with the publisher and get it I guess in terms of when they put on events and stuff I, I don't know if that helps but but yeah so, so your debut collection that came out last year is that right it did yeah March last year so uh yeah just over a year it's been out and how do you, are you sort of itching to get started on a new one or are you focusing on your kids book for now? Or? Yeah, I think I'm sort of, I'm definitely one of these people that has like something that they aim for. And then when it's yeah. done, I really struggle to kind of keep hold of that and kind of keep looking back. And I have to keep reminding myself that these poems that you've been working on for a few years, you might be sick of them, but they're new to everybody else. And they're still new to loads of people out there that have never heard of me before, never yeah, heard me read, really never read any of my poems. And I'm like, oh God, if I've got to read this Alan Shearer poem one more time. But I think <laughs> you've got to, you, you feel like, I mean, that's an easy one actually, because I do, I do, I, I love that poem. I love kind of, you know, particularly now, I still love being able to kind of imagine that this, that football still exists somehow. Um, but I think, yeah, I'm still, still pushing that. But at the same time, I'm, I'm more or less there with um, um, another collection that I've kind of been working on alongside it. So I, I've always kind of got things that are overlapping and, and, and always yeah. writing something down and, and seeing how that goes. But yeah, Bernie and I are really lucky to have a fantastic relationship with them. They're a really good, willing publisher. They're, they're really supportive. They, um, uh, I, yeah, I couldn't have asked for more from them in terms of my first, first collection. Yeah, fair play. They are an amazing publisher like that. For anybody who doesn't know, Bernie and I are the leading publisher of spoken word artists and artists that are sort of seen as being alternative. Um, I don't want to get into too much of a poetry establishment. Um, uh, well, <laughs> but yeah, they're an amazing alternative publisher and I'd say they're the best indie publisher in the UK, so you should check them out. Um, do you yeah, fancy giving us another couple of poems? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I'm going to read one, actually. I'm going to read two fairly new ones. Um, one of the like one of the things that has helped me when I was a bit when I when I was sort of coming out of feeling a bit unwell, I was in the middle of doing a um, an online course with Spread the Word, and I yeah. massively recommend doing that. And they were they were fantastic. And actually, 
it's the first kind of distant learning poetry course that I've done. I normally like, I've done one with you, Matt, before, and I really like that connection of being in a room and kind of um, sparking off the people in the room. Um, but they managed to kind of, they, they had an app that you use and it was really good to be able to do it. And, and Rachel Long, who was the, the poet who facilitated that, I couldn't be more full of praise for actually how she supported us during that time. She was so willing to kind of extend the feedback sessions, knowing that people were kind of had other stuff going on. And the feedback that she gave was so detailed, far more than you would have expected for something like that. So we were um, uh, having to write about home and memories of, of like connecting with childhood and things like that. So this poem is, is about that. I grew up in, um, uh, in, in Lancashire. I uh, was born in Blackburn, but lived in a small town next door to it called Darwin and then a small village next door to that. So this is about being an eight-year-old in that village. Uh, and it's called Lancashire Home Delivery. Every Sunday, 4 p.m., the video man would pull up in his car. Rusted wheel arches and Fido Dido sticker in the rear window. My brother and I would sit on the end terrace wall. Rows of roses, begonias, geraniums and us. We both had a quid. That was enough for a video to rent. It was a reward for doing errands in brandless trainers that had been brought home in a carrier bag by Dad. Milk, still udder warm, collected from the dairy farm. A bottle of sarsaparilla and one of cream soda from the pot van. Veg from any one of the allotments round our way. A nudge to fill up on water, or corporation pot, as my granddad would say. A neck chicken from the coop, declucked, plucked and cooked by mum, then scoffed by the family clutch. Then a video, finally. My eight-year-old eyes would scan hundreds of cacandy cover photocopies. The Terminator, Weird Science, Gremlins. There'd be no ID check, not when our coins would become four charges on his gas meter. Dad's voice would appear through a cloud of Benson and Edges. I'll do cock. What's new this week? He was our boss, a human cotton mill chimney overseeing his workers, the two of us, two spinning mules weaving from video title to video title. I look back and how much of that stuff in our house was legit. Bought off someone over a pint and pork scratchings down the back of the street or out of the classifieds. We didn't care. Not when we were stuffed on roast potatoes and knockoff videos. Yes, quality. I love that. That's <laughs> nice. The video man, that's, that's mad. <laughs> we genuinely turned up in the back of a, in a, in a blue Ford Sierra and would open the hatchback and there'd just be like hundreds of videos <laughs> in the back. <laughs> we just... <laughs> The questions asked, we gave him a quid, we got a video, and then we gave it him back the next week. <laughs> yeah, no need to ask questions. But that's mad. We never had a video, man, but I remember going down to Blockbuster for a rare treat. God, that's just totally gone, in it? Uh, anyways, people yeah. don't know how lucky they are nowadays. Um, that's right. That's, yeah. So it's, it's sort of between 10 to and 5 to, so um, I've got time for a couple more, obviously, but if there's any in particular that you want to read. Um, yeah. Yeah. I've got, yeah, I've got one more here again, which is sort of fairly new. And another thing that I've been able to kind of, I was talking about access to things. And one of the things that I've had a lot of access to has been um, in terms of being able to keep fit is like fitness classes, weirdly. I, I do a bit of yoga and I've got into that over the past couple of years. And I've, and I've been doing yoga classes in like Austin and Holland and all over the world. And it's been really good for me in a sense of actually being able to reconnect with my legs that I've kind of had a really difficult relationship with and my chair in particular and I've yeah. kind of been able to, to to kind of move them around and things like that so um yeah yoga's got it's it sort of really helped with my mental health and well-being and all that sort of stuff and and this poem is, is about that so it's a bit niche but it it still fits in with with this stuff as well so it's called guided by the voice cool. I fold my legs into a pigeon lift them like a marionettist into a happy baby not once does anyone ask if the guy in a wheelchair in amongst the lycra is an interloper. I unfurl my reconstructed spine into a forward fold, head between knees as though embrace, brace. After the accident, I almost slipped into permanent corpse pose. Don't forget to breathe. My legs became still, but they're still talking. It's just, I stopped listening. There's a voice still there below the line of no return. It's just softer, the energy different. The legs want to be heard. With head bowed, I offer a barely audible apology. I'm sorry for all those years of resentment. A different voice from the front, familiar. It guides through eagle arms. Find what feels good 
it says, a room reaches forward, feet on mat and one pair of wheels. Each one of us lost in our own cloud of incense, but connected. Just do your best, the voice says. I take my hand behind my knee and lift. Oh, stunning. That you say that's new? Um, Newish, yeah. So this is, it was sort of written, um, uh, I'd been to a, a yoga class and it was one of the first ones I'd been to and I was like obviously the only person there in a chair but, but kind of came away from that just feeling like oh, if I can kind of do a yoga class then then I'm all right I sort of you know and kind of just muddle my way through it and adapt it all go along so yeah no it was um and that that pretty much on the journey home kind of just came out of my head so it was um uh yeah that's one of the things that I think I've missed about lockdown is that having that um spark of observation stuff that you see or those kind of real world things that are happening that enable you to get yeah. it down on paper i'm having to use my imagination a lot more which is um uh yeah i'm having to sort of dredge stuff up and think how do i get this this thing in here working again yeah i guess it's for lack of stimulants in it i suppose if you're in your house all day every day and you basically go to a shop and that's it it's for lack of stimulants and journeys and people in it like a, a lot of, I, I know a lot of writers write when they're traveling and obviously you read when you're traveling don't you it is a real really great way to yeah well it'd be interesting to see how uh, what comes out of it i suppose there's going to be loads of amazing art created whether it's immediately afterwards or being created right now it's fascinating isn't it yeah i wonder in, in like a year's time how many kind of um open mics will be going to where where every poem is about isolation and lockdown you know I wonder how long it'll take for, for, for us to work our way through all of those poems that are in here that we're trying to think about Edinburgh Fringe is going to be a shit show in it yeah loving it's, the coronavirus <laughs> God. Yeah, at least it's, it's, uh, people doing some poems yeah I think but, who knows a lot of these festivals you know we'll, we might see a lot more things kind of crop up online I think it's going to be really interesting in terms of actually what that what that means going forwards I think I think it's, yeah, I really hope so. Like, like you were saying earlier, um, it's, it's improving the accessibility, obviously for somebody who's a wheelchair user, uh, geographically, like, you know, if somebody lives in a really remote town, it's not easy for them to dip into Manchester city centre or Bristol city centre, is it? And then financially, there's all kinds of reasons, isn't there? I love how That's much true. this opens it up. I really do. Um, so yeah, I, I really appreciate you joining us today, mate. It's lovely to hear you work as always. Like I say, when I saw you at Shambhala, I think I, I saw you do a set with Tung Fu and then you did a solo one the day after, I think. Yeah, and I just really love where you work straight away. So um, where can we find you online? Is it at Spoke and Pencil? Is that right? At Spoke and Pencil, yeah. And then there's links to kind of like my website and stuff like that. But yeah, Spoke and Pencil. So I'm still trying to put stuff out. I'm still doing my own kind of like online stuff and just keeping things out there, really. I think he's kind of helpful but yeah yeah be great people come and cool. give me a follow that'd be good yeah and your books available through burning eye direct that's the best place yeah. to get it, in it. And, or, or um, your local also, yeah and you can get it from me as well so on my um my right, cool. uh, insta page you can get a link there i see a lot of people saying they're sending out um sanitized books and i'm not quite sure what that means yet so i don't know if it means i've got to wet wipe my book before i put it in an envelope or something or put it under the shower or something i don't know but i'll it'll be sanitized you won't catch out from my book it'll be right just be... <laughs> i won't lick the yeah, stamp i promise <laughs> fair play good to know all right mate well <laughs> thanks for joining us and uh I'll, I'll see you soon in person hopefully yeah cheers matt and thanks for everything you've been doing as well with all this it's great to kind of you know being really generous with your time and, and kind of giving a platform to other poets i think it's, it's really it's really good i think yeah so um oh, and you do some no, fantastic yeah, I'm really, really, good, really pleased to have been on. It's been great. Cool. Thank you, mate. Cheers, nice mate. one. Thanks. Cheers. Cheers. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. So that was the wonderful Stephen Lightbound. Um, like his website direct, check out Burning Eye Books, who we were speaking about earlier. And join me next week, same time, 7.30 to 8, where we have Emily Harrison joining us. So Emily Harrison won the Saboteur Award for Best Spoken Word Performer a couple of years ago. And her debut collection, I Can't Sleep Because My Bed Is On Fire, that was also published by Bernie Nye Books fairly recently. So join us, half seven to late UK time, uh, Tuesday the 2nd of June for Emily Harrison. My name's Matt Abbott. We are them some thugs. Have a good night. Cheers. Yeah.